It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. The goal of the Joseph Smith Papers Project is to publish a comprehensive record of documents created by Joseph Smith or people who he directed. And this includes journals and revelations, translations, contemporary reports of his discourses and minutes and business and legal records, editorials, and all sorts of documents. A counterfactual historian might argue that if there'd been no Book of Mormon, there'd be no need for a Joseph Smith Papers Project. The dust jacket of the latest book in the Joseph Smith Papers Project says the Book of Mormon is the centerpiece of Joseph Smith's documentary record. In this episode, Robin Scott Jensen's here to talk about the printer's manuscript of the Book of Mormon, which was published in August 2015 by the Church Historians Press. Jensen's a historian for The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and together with Royal Skousen, he edited the printer's manuscript. It's volume three of the Revelations and Translation series of the Joseph Smith Papers Project. Questions and comments about this and other episodes of the Maxwell Institute podcast can be sent to mipodcast at byu.edu. And if you like the show, please share it with your friends and take a minute to rate and review it on iTunes. Robin Scott Jensen, welcome to the Maxwell Institute podcast. It's a pleasure to be with you. I thought we'd start with the most obvious question and one that people probably don't even really need to hear the answer to. It's a question about what the Joseph Smith Papers Project is. And while you're explaining that, maybe you can talk a little bit about how you came to be involved in the project yourself. So very simply, the Joseph Smith Papers Project is uh, an attempt to publish all known Joseph Smith documents. Uh, now, simple explanation, of course, doesn't get to the complexities of things. Uh, this has a long history, actually. Dean Jesse, uh, in the 70s, began thinking about publishing the Joseph Smith documents. He was looking at examples such as the Thomas Jefferson Papers, George Washington Papers, these founding fathers and other important figures, uh, as a resource for scholars. And Dean thought this would be perfect for Joseph Smith. Joseph, uh, of course, is a, an important religious figure. Uh, scholars of religion, scholars of American history, would be interested in uncovering these these documents. So Dean began the work, and that has continued uh, to this day. I began my experience with the Joseph Smith Papers uh, as a graduate student, actually, here at BYU. Uh, I was working on a master's degree, and I jumped at the chance to uh, be a research assistant working on this wonderful project. And I fell in love. Uh, I fell in love with the research, uh, the documents. I understood implicitly how important the documents were in getting them right and making them available for scholars. As I was doing my own research, I realized how difficult sometimes it was to find the sources. And I began to use our own documentation, our own uh, work. uh, And it was wonderful. So when I graduated with a master's degree in history. They gave me a full-time job. I'm one of those rarities of finding a job in history right after uh, getting a master's degree. And they moved up to the Church Church Historian's Library, the Church History Library, uh, the department there at the church. This is where the church kind of adopted it from what Dean Jesse was doing at BYU, and they said, "Let's, let's move it to the Church History Department and really put resources behind it, right? And I Correct. think there were some donors who came forward. And- uh-huh. Yeah, so uh, Larry H. Miller uh, took a real interest in the Joseph Smith Papers Project. It's not well known, but he had a, a real interest in history. He, he thought that it was an important uh, topic to, to study. So he began speaking with a few people and uh, made the resources available to really expand the project to uh, what it is today. So they moved it up to the church in 2005. I moved up with them and began my full-time uh, career there, and I, I was in heaven. Uh, it was a treat to go into work uh, every single day, and we just began looking at the sources. Now, a lot of people think the Joseph Smith documents, the his, history of the church, a lot of those documents are already out there. They're available for scholars, and to some degree that is correct, but Uh, I think readers are sometimes surprised at the amount of uh, contextual information and transcription information that has been missed by previous scholarship. And the Joseph Smith Papers has really made an effort to get both the historical context and the textual scholarship right. 
And as you've been working on the project yourself, you've kind of been involved uh, with one of the series within the project, but you've also been doing some personal uh, s- scholarly development as well, right? They've kind of helped, uh, you've continued to do some mm-hmm. schooling, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, as I was working on my master's degree here at BYU, I, like many graduate students, I had a existential crisis of trying to figure <laughs> out what uh, I needed to do, and I didn't necessarily want to teach, so I thought uh, working at an archives would be uh, wonderful. So My very last semester here at BYU was my first semester of a second master's program, uh, an online degree for the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, and that was a library science degree with an archival concentration. And I thought that 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 was my uh, uh, role in life. I wasn't quite sure of my future with the Joseph Smith papers, but then I got offered this position, and I was wondering whether I should continue with that uh, other master's or not, and I got enough encouragement that... Uh, I went ahead and finished that, and then... And it was basically just memorizing the Dewey Decimal System. Yes, right, from, exactly, you know, exactly. Like, which is sad, because, you know, it's kind of... Not, not, not enough people use it anymore, so... I'm the life of the party. I mean, what can I say? <laughs> <laughs> but when I when I finished my second master's program, I uh, got into the PhD program at the University of Utah. I uh, it, it came as a very sad realization that I'm now entering my second decade of graduate school. Um that's what I get for trying to earn graduate degrees on the side while working <laughs> full time. But uh, but the church has given me a, a great uh, uh, resource there, and I've I've sh- surely benefited. And my archival degree and now my uh, PhD has really uh, benefited the project. I feel. Yeah, it seems like the church is really interested in the professional development of the people that are working on the project. There's this increasing push for professionalization and the idea that that you can be a very strong academic in and and get along and, and perform well in the academy and also do good scholarship for the church as well. Uh, is, right. Is yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I think the church has realized that uh, Mormon history, uh, Mormon scholarship is going to go on whether uh, anyone at the church is going to do anything about it or not. And I think the church history library has uh, done a really nice job in the last several decades of understanding that they can be engaged in the conversation, the scholarly conversation. Um, there's enough room in Mormon studies, Mormon history, um, other scholarship that uh, we really have uh, a lot to offer uh, because, for one thing, we sit on uh, the largest collection of Mormon documents there are, and we really should be a, a part of that conversation. Okay, so that kind of gives us an idea of the overall Joseph Smith Papers Project, your involvement in it. Let's... Um Let's talk about uh, what you're here to buzz market today. This is the latest uh, uh, volume that just came out, and it's uh, part of the Revelations and Translations series of the Joseph Smith Papers Project. There are, there are several of these series. They include Revelations and Translations, Histories, Journals, Documents, Legal Records, and Administrative Records. Uh, the last one's... I'm sorry, that sounds... <laughs> <laughs> That's probably pretty dry reading. But uh, uh, as for the revelations and translations, that seems to be kind of the just a really important part of the project. So this is the uh, printer's manuscript of the Book of Mormon, uh, the printer's manuscript. So maybe talk a little bit about um, how, you, how the printer's manuscript is situated within the overall revelations and translations series. It seems like a pretty obvious fit, but there are also some gray areas in terms of how to classify some of these Joseph Smith documents. So talk yeah, a little bit about yeah. that. So um, we have broken up the project into six different series. It gets uh, a little confusing, in fact, uh, because as you could well imagine, it's not always easy to categorize and uh, dissect these documents into distinct series. Uh, in fact, some of the revelations that we've already published in the Revelation and Translation series are also part of the document series. Uh, and that overlap has confused some readers. Um, I jokingly say that we in the Joseph Smith Papers have tried to make this as confusing as possible. Uh, they are surprised that we've now published our 11th volume. They think that we've only published two or three. Um, but the printer's manuscript, as you say, is is a perfect fit. I, I talk to sometimes members of the church, and they're surprised that First of all, when I tell them what I do, they're surprised that there's actually any scholarly interest. They they aren't quite familiar enough with the broader context of American scholar American history scholarship to know that Joseph Smith and and, and Mormonism, the Church, is uh, a, a very legitimate uh, thing to study, uh, and it's becoming even more and more popular. 
And so the one of the reason, of course, that Joseph Smith is so studied is because of his religious, uh, the the founding of the this church. H- him as a religious leader is very important. So the Re- Revelation and Translation series is, of course, one of the most important series because it represents who Joseph Smith is and why he's so important for scholars. Now, I, th- I think if you look kind of take a very broad look at the Revelations and Translation series, it's, it's actually quite interesting. We've, uh, there are different uh, documents within that uh, series uh, because the way in which Joseph Smith brought forth Scripture uh, is important for members, it's important for scholars, but I think what we need to remember is that it's uh, not a set way. Jo- Joseph Smith is translating a record. He's translating the Book of Mormon. He's receiving revelations. He's translating the Joseph Smith uh, translation of the Bible. He's translating the Book of Abraham. All of these are considered scripture for uh, Latter-day Saints. They're seen as religious texts for scholars. But the way in which he's bringing these forth is complicated and messy and not very easily fit into neat categories. And so uh, when all is said and done, I think the totality of the texts in the Revelation and Translation series will fit very nicely in one sense, but also um, show the complexity of the uh, and the complication of the revelations and the translation that Joseph Smith is bringing forth. Yeah, it's really interesting, the categorization of that stuff. Um, so in Volume 3, again, it's the, the printer's manuscript of the Book of Mormon. So just take a quick second and talk about that compared to the original mm-hmm. manuscript, because that's still something that a lot of uh, people wonder about. Yeah, so um, I, I think maybe we could step back. The um, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints founded on a religious text. That's not uncommon. Uh, Mormonism has often been seen recently in scholarship as a world religion. I think when we step back and think about the Book of Mormon, it's, it's actually quite remarkable that the earliest members of the Church— uh, first saw the Book of Mormon in print. That's not how it happened with Christianity or Islam or other world religions. Uh, Manuscript texts were crucial in spreading those faiths. But for Mormonism, it was the printed work. Um, And so, by and large, we do not have the types and numbers of manuscripts that other world religions have. We have two manuscripts, two significant manuscripts that scholars need to study. Um, And yet, uh, you know, except for a few notable exceptions, scholars of Mormonism have have largely ignored those manuscripts. And uh, so, uh, very briefly, the original manuscript was that dictated by Joseph Smith to scribes. And then when they finished that work, uh, Joseph had Oliver Cowdery make a second copy known as the printer's manuscript. And it's with those two manuscripts that we have this this sacred text, this scripture for uh, individuals. And it's based upon those two manuscripts that a lot of the textual work, the textual comparison and analysis can be done. It really goes to show, too, how even though we have what's what we can consider to be kind of the primary source document, aside from the, um, you know, obviously uh, coming, we don't have the plates, right? The gold plates aren't around. So this is what we have. And there's still a lot of unanswered questions about, about even just something as simple as the printer's manuscript being created. They didn't sit down and write out their justification for doing that. There, we can extrapolate and kind of imagine why they did it, but they never sat down and wrote about why they did it. They didn't write about when it happened exactly or, you know, all these things. So there's so, there's so many gaps, even though we have those actual documents, there's still so many gaps. Yeah. Yeah, And it, and it doesn't help that in uh, 1841, Joseph Smith deposited the original manuscript into the cornerstone of the Nauvoo house. Um, Decades later, for safekeeping, right? It sounds like a uh, yes, great. Yes, uh, when uh, when you want to preserve a manuscript, <laughs> it's my professional opinion that you should not place it into a cornerstone near the Mississippi River. Um, <laughs> it just does all sorts of things with uh, mold and water damage. But you know, decades later, when they pulled it out, it just it, it was falling apart. Uh, much of it was damaged, so that today we only have twenty eight percent of the the original manuscript. So we're really we, we're talking about these two manuscripts and the close scrutiny that we do, but. Uh, because a, a, a significant portion of that original manuscript is not extant, we are left with, uh, as you say, many of these unanswered questions. All right, so we, so you take the 
the stuff that we do have, and we have m- almost all of the printer's manuscript. Right? Yes, there's there just a little uh, section of it. There's missing? about a line and a half yeah. on one leaf that's missing from the text. But and it was like the top sheet, right? The very top sheet, yeah. and uh, it's just through age and wear and whatnot that kind of flaked off. So yeah, the top sheet always on like a yellow legal pad. The top yeah. of the paper always gets messed up. So it's <laughs> exactly. like you guys, they should have put like another. You know, you don't write important things on the very top sheet. Yeah, of anything, right? like do you ever want to like go back in time and tell them like, hey, uh, <laughs> here's something you can do. Just have a nice title page or something there, yeah. but start on the second leaf. <laughs> <laughs> so you have, so we have uh, almost all of that, um, and then what the Joseph Smith volumes do uh, is there are photographs on one side of the of the manuscript, and then on the other side, there's a transcription of that. And transcription is just typed out uh, exactly uh, what appears there. So let's talk about the editorial method. And this speaks to the whole Joseph Smith Papers project as well. And I think this is something you're especially obsessed with, uh, this really minute stuff. So let's hear about some of these details. What are some of the rules of transcription that the Joseph Smith Papers uh, project follows? Yeah, so uh, you just described what we call the facsimile edition. Most of our volumes don't follow that standard. Uh, we have just the transcription. Sometimes we have illustrations that kind of give a sense of what the document might look like. But for two of the volumes of the Revelations and Translation series, including this volume of the printer's manuscript, we have for every single manuscript page, all 465 or four, I always forget, of the uh, printer's manuscript, we have the facsimile, the photograph of the page on the left-hand side and the transcription on the right. And that transcription is also slightly different than most of the other volumes. It's, it's called a typographical facsimile. So if in the manuscript they wrote a, wor- a, a word above the line, we would transcribe that word above the line. Uh, if they've crossed something out, then we cross that out. If they've written over the word, we have a way in which we can uh, identify that. So um, oftentimes people will say, well, this is actually the next best thing to the original. And in some ways, it's in fact better than the original. Uh, If you had access to the original manuscript, in order to match what we have here in this book, you would have to have 25 plus years of experience with the manuscript. You'd have to have uh, multispectral imaging. You'd You'd have have to be Royal Skousen. You'd have to be (laughs) Royal Skousen to have this better than, uh, than the original. So we have essentially given this transcription such close scrutiny and care that um, in some ways it is better than uh, a, a novice or or a scholar accessing the original manuscript. Plus you get a, people that read it are going to learn cool words like pilcro and stuff exactly. like that, right? Exactly. Which is that kind of little paragraph symbol uh-huh. and the stuff. The paragraph symbol has a name, in yeah. fact, the pilcro. Yeah. So, all right. So that's kind of what the transcription is about. Um, and as you, we mentioned Royal Skousen, uh, how does the transcription in this differ from the transcription that Royal Skousen has done in the Book of Mormon Critical Text Project, which mm-hmm. is something that the Maxwell Institute and farms before it housed for about 25 years, and the remainder of which uh, will be published through BYU Studies. So how does the transcription differ there? So Royal Skousen very, was very kind. Uh, we approached him and, and said, we have this Revelations and Translation series. We would love to have uh, the, the Book of Mormon a part of that, and we would love to have your work as part of that. And he very graciously agreed um, it, it, to some degree, we could not have done this without Royal. Uh, we would have had to uh, uh, retranscribe everything and, and do all the work that he did. And so it's 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 very uh, good for us that that Royal was able to um, lend us his transcription, and he essentially gave us his transcription, and then. Any documentary editing project is going to transcribe their documents differently. Uh, the editorial method of different projects uh, um, take different approaches depending on the philosophy. Uh, the Joseph Smith Papers project is actually fairly um, uh, conservative. We're, we're, we're quite careful in preserving spelling and and bad grammar and and punctuation and and all of that stuff it's not covering up all that stuff or changing them you're as true to the document exactly exactly um but as as careful as we are royals transcription was even more careful uh what he is, what are he, some of those so for seen? instance he he was quite careful in um identifying uh certain marks that we would have ignored so if if the scribe was going to write an M, for instance, and they added an extra hump to that M, so we have four strokes, Royal would have noted that. We would have given the scribe the benefit of the doubt and transcribed that as an M. Um, uh, when uh, the scribe 
begins to write a D, for instance, but never finishes it out, Royal would make a careful note of that, whereas we would at certain times simply ignore the fact that they uh, didn't finish this character. So what I did uh, when we got the transcription from Royal, uh, I went through it word by word, line by line, uh, taking our the Joseph Smith paper's editorial style and uh, imposing it upon uh, Royal's transcription. Um, and this was sometimes easily done. So, for instance, he uses angle brackets to indicate a word is deleted. We simply have a, a line through, a strike through. Uh, and so that's a fairly easy fix. But there were other times where it was a bit more complicated. Um, I would have to carefully read his description in the footnotes. Uh, and if we had an editorial uh, uh, symbol for that, we could do that. But oftentimes we had to adopt that. So... Um, this is Royal's transcription with the Joseph Smith papers treatment, you could say. Uh, so for those interested in the uh, absolute most detail possible, Royal's work is still going to be indispensable as it has been for the you know since they've been published. For those that may uh, see Royal's work as a little too much for them, and I have met scholars who, uh, feel that um, they're, they're a little intimidated by Royal's work because the um, the transcription style can get a little complicated. Then this this volume presents it in uh, a bit simpler uh, method, and then of course the photographs are are unique. That's new to the Joseph Smith papers. Royal had a few uh, illustrations at the beginnings of his books, but um, and Royal would say the same thing. He's he's quite pleased that now the full color images of each page are out there. As you went through the transcription and 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 gave Royal's uh, transcription the Joseph Smith papers treatment, did you ever get to also use the actual manuscript itself? Uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, I I went out to Independence a few times and I, I held the manuscripts and I, I checked a few things, but uh, we used Royal's transcription and the high the high um, resolution digital scans that we have. Cool. Um, this is Robin Scott Jensen. He's a historian for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and co-editor of the printer's manuscript of the Book of Mormon that just came out with the Joseph Smith Papers Project. Um, the photos which we're talking about are they're they're quite beautiful. Um, I you know I think the dis, the book is about as big as it could be and still be a reasonable yeah <laughs> uh, purchase. Yep. Uh, but you know it looks really nice. Um, and with Royal's level of detail, I think some of that can also be accommodated by giving people access to the images, too. Exactly. So, the, the Royal's level of treatment was, uh, in some ways, necessary because the images were not available. Uh, there were quite a few times where Royal uh, takes great pains to describe a certain feature of the text, and I could delete that and that footnote because we had the image right there. It was quite apparent uh, with the image. And after a while, I know um, the Joseph Smith Papers Project has been putting all of their materials up online um, months after the printed volumes come out. So I think uh, people can look forward to, uh, in the uh, after a while here, being able to look at those photos themselves. And on the Joseph Smith Papers Project website, it's so easy to zoom in on images and, and move around on them and compare them to the transcription. It's, it's a uh, really impressively uh, designed website. So yep. people that don't want to... Uh, pick up the book, uh, we'll be able to benefit from that here after a while. I think it's great. Yeah, so the Joseph Smith Papers um, website, josephsmithpapers.org, is a tremendous resource, and we are committed to uh, presenting all of the documents on, on that website eventually, and that, that uh, already is, but will continue to be it's such a great resource for scholars and members, of course. Now, as you've been going through this project, you've, you've spent quite a bit of time with the text of the Book of Mormon really closely in terms of looking at the transcription, looking at the uh, at the manuscript, and, and making sure that the transcription matches and, and so forth. In the process of that, you've also um, been writing and producing some little articles and pieces on the side. Mm -hmm. For example, you spoke here, uh, you were invited to speak here at BYU this week, um, sponsored by the the Willis Center here at the Maxwell Institute and uh, BYU Studies, and, and Royal Skousen joined you there, and, and you both spoke. And you spoke about the witnesses of the Book of Mormon translation, and we're going to put up a uh, video of that here uh, um, in, the in the next couple months, whenever the editing of that's complete. But you also have an article coming out in, in the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies, and by the time people hear this episode, it will, it will be available uh, on the Maxwell Institute website. This is 
uh, an article about Abner Cole, and I thought it would be interesting uh, for you to talk a little bit about that article that is something that grew out of the project. Yeah, so um, I'm... I'm a scholar that's very interested in the texts, uh, both printed and manuscript, uh, and not just the contents of those documents, but I'm, I'm interested in what they say, uh, what, how they're treated as artifacts. These, these documents have certain symbolism and certain meaning behind them that isn't related to the content at all. So, so I began really looking at the printer's manuscript and how it was used in the uh, Palmyra print shop there in, in uh, 1830 for the first edition. And of course, we know the story Abner Cole uh, pirates some of the passages of the Book of Mormon. He's he's publishing parts of uh, First Nephi. He then publishes some of Alma. And I was very interested in that. I, I, is this I, the Dogberry Papers on Winter exactly. Hill? Like, yes. W- what does that refer to? <laughs> he he was an interesting character. Uh, Did he just like make that up? Like, I, I don't understand the reference. Uh, I think uh, Andy Hedges has an article that mentions it, but I forget what he he made a guess as to what it meant, but I forgot what it was. Yeah. Something with Shakespeare or something else. Anyway, um, he, he was a he was a he was a character. Yeah, he um, was like taking the Book of Mormon, and he. And he was putting it in the newspaper uh-huh. and calling it the Dogberry Papers on Winter Hill or something like that. Right? Yeah. Well, uh, he was pretty clear that when he did the excerpt that he was just—I mean, excerpt from the Book it. of Mormon—and and he. Wh- what I find actually interesting is that he, of course, is critical. He's making fun of Joseph yeah. and and other saints, but but he's not filtering the Book of Mormon text. He believes that the Book of Mormon text on the surface will convince people that this is a fraud. Uh, and Joseph and Oliver Cadre believed that the Book of Mormon on the surface could convince people that this was divine. So it, it was just this um, uh, th- this test for people uh, th- to see whether they would believe or not. And so Abner Cole said, I'm going to publish the Book of Mormon and it will convince people that it's a fraud. And then, of course, from Lucy Mac Smith, we have the story. Joseph comes in and tells him he can't do that. He d- doesn't have the right and... Like a WikiLeaks of the 19th century exactly. situation, where he's like he's leaking <laughs> these documents like early. Well, so Abner Cole is he had an agreement with E. B. Grandin to use his press, and this is the press that's printing the Book of Mormon. And uh, Abner Cole agrees to work nights and uh, on Sundays when uh, um, Grandin uh, is not working. And so you know, there's uh, sheets, reams of paper with the Book of Mormon just laying about. And Abner Cole, there's no supervision there, so uh, he he pulls the first sheet of the Book of Mormon, sees that it's First Nephi chapter one, and he prints it in his newspaper. Um, and so I, in my article, I talk about this, but then I also talk about Alma. So Alma section or Alma chapter twenty, the uh, it's chapter twenty in the 1830 edition. He publishes this uh, in mid January, and as I looked at the uh, article in the Reflector, the Palmyra Reflector, which is Abner Cole's newspaper, I saw that there were certain errors that wouldn't make sense. So, of course, this is a time when you have to hand set the type for the newspaper, letter by letter, character by character. You're holding yep. these little teeny types and setting them yep. into the frames. Yep, exactly. It was very tedious work. Um, and Abner Cole, he's pirating this work. He's going to cut corners. And he does cut corners. He makes some mistakes with this section of Alma. Uh, there are words in there that uh, don't have spaces. They're run-on words. Two two words run together. Um, of course, the space is also a type that you have to set. And so, uh, periodically, you see these uh, mistakes, you see these typos, um, and you don't think anything of it. But as I looked more carefully, I realized that uh, whenever the word was run together, that also matched with the end of line in the 1830 publication. So we have to remember the 1830 Book of Mormon has wider uh, uh, text block than the Palmyra Reflector. And so... Yeah, they're like newspaper columns, skinny correct. newspaper columns, yep. and, and the Book of Mormon was laid out on a page for a book. Of course, as a book, yeah. yeah. So um, what Abner Cole— in, in a single column, too, uh-huh, not like today's column. Book of Mormon is separated into two columns. Yeah. Back then, it was just all the way across the page, yep, like you'd like see in a novel. A novel. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So what I concluded, and uh, I'm convinced that this has happened, Abner Cole, as he was pirating the uh, first Nephi, 
begins to see what else he can do, and he sees Alma is at that time set in type for printing of the 1830 Book of Mormon. And so likely what happened, they had finished the type, but they haven't they hadn't yet deposited the type back into the cases. And so all he had to do was take the type <laughs> that was set already for the Book of Mormon, rearrange that type for the width of the columns, and put it in his newspaper. Mm-hmm. So it was uh, his version of the copying and pasting, right? But the errors came when he forgot to add a space at the end of the line of the Book of Mormon. So it ran on, ran together, those two, the, the words, uh, showing us, giving us evidence that this in fact happened. Now what's interesting, I mean, of course this is interesting and, and you should all run out and tell your friends all about this because it's such <laughs> it's a fascinating viral. story. <laughs> but the implication, of course, with this is this tells us exactly, uh, not exactly exactly, but it helps us understand where they are at in the printing process of the 1830 Book of Mormon. When those editions of the paper came out. Yeah, yeah. So when, when Alma, chapter 20 of the 1830 edition, uh, were, were, was being printed is January 22nd when uh, Abner Cole was able to uh, print this uh, this copy. So it's it's uh, granted a small detail. I sometimes run home and tell my wife about this exciting find at work, and she says that's not exciting at all. You are a big nerd. Uh, so I rec- I've come to grips with the fact that. Uh, I find things interesting that most people don't yes, even and the think stuff about. Like, this is ampersand, and it was actually an S that had that had like a defect in the little metal type. Like that kind exactly. Of yeah. I mean, this is what this, this is my bread and butter. This is what I live for. But uh, but I I think the implications are, are uh, important. There it helps us reconstruct this um, this process of printing the manuscript. And uh, scholars of the book, uh, book historians understand that um, the production of a book is very important. Uh, we've, w- we think of, uh, we understand the book is kind of uh, impersonal. You send off the manuscript and all of a sudden, f- three weeks later, you get a book in the mail and it's, it's amazing. Uh, this was a much more personal, much more involved process. And there were a lot of humans involved. Uh, there's there was this whole structure created around the creation of the book, and the more we try to uncover that, the more we try to uh, situate the 1830 Book of Mormon within the context of this print culture of the 19th century, the better we can understand the coming forth of the of the Book of Mormon. You know, we talk about early um, Christianity and the way that they they can tease out of some of these early manuscripts, the dates and other things. We can do the same thing with the publication of the Book of Mormon. Another thing that you talked about, and let's talk about your the um, paper that you gave here this week a little bit about the witnesses to the translation process, because it bears on this exact subject, the fact that there were a lot of hands at work in getting the Book of Mormon to where it was. And I, I love the point that you made about how the Book of Mormon is kind of one of the, maybe the first religious text that first appeared to the public as a book. Like with Christianity, there were letters and there was there were oral sayings mm-hmm. that were later written and, and that existed before what later became the Bible. And with, uh, with the Quran, it's the same, that, yeah. that, that, that it was recited, it was poetic, and it was memorized and, and passed on and then began to be recorded and yeah. these types of things. With the Book of Mormon, we have that kind of a textual history, but it's but there's this line between what we have today and what it was, because those gold plates are gone. Yep. And the records that were, that, that were written upon are gone. We don't have access to those. Here we just have this book, and it first appeared to the public, 1830, in a printed book. And I think the implications there are important to remember. So uh, at the early 19th century, there is a difference, of course, at any century, there's a difference between manuscript and print. When you see a book of scripture in print for the first time, and there's, if you read the 1830 Book of Mormon cover to cover, there's very little context to this coming forth of the Book of Mormon. There's a, there's a very short preface there's the testimony of the three and eight witnesses. But any 19th century history, 19th century context to the coming forth, it's, it, there's very little in there. So uh, already we have this printed book that almost appears out of nowhere, and it, it gives this uh, sense of, uh, of permanence, of importance, of um, it's not a manuscript. It's not a. It's not a hand copied text that your neighbor's going to give you, and you say, "What is this? Is this?" There's a professionalism to it, right? There, there's Joseph Smith realizes that 
uh, when he's printing this many books books of Mormon, it's going to uh, send a message without anyone even having to open the cover. And of course, you have uh, the wonderful scholarship already done of comparing the bindings. So the Book of Mormon 1830 Mm -hmm. is very similar to the Bibles of the day. So when you see the Book of Mormon on the shelf, you can think, oh, this is a sacred book because it reminds me of yep. this Bible that I've I've recalled. So, so I I think that we as scholars need to remember that um, just because it's in printed form does not mean that there's not certain artifactual uh, characteristics about this text. Uh, the Book of Mormon in in print sent a sent a message to the early Latter Day Saints, the early potential Latter Day Saints. And us trying to recover that, I think, is I think is important. The, this reception history of the Book of Mormon, um, there, there's a lot of work still to be done on that. Another interesting element of that story involves people who were who helped with the printing process. And I I thought this was really great when you talked about um, Gilbert, John Gilbert, mm-hmm. um, uh, one of the typesetters. Maybe was he the chief typesetter? Or yeah. So he later in his life was quite proud of the fact that he set most of the type. He was the compositor, the typesetter for the Book of Mormon. And he gave a lot of interviews, uh, very important interviews, because he gives kind of the uh, understanding of how what he was doing, uh, you know, the process. And we know from him about how long it took uh, per week and how many uh, sheets they could do. Um, but he wasn't a believer. He, he did not believe Joseph Smith's story. He did not uh, join the church. He later in his life um, tried to explain the Book of Mormon away. He flirted with the Spalding manuscript theory and whatnot because he was trying to figure out how Joseph could have come, how, how he could have uh, produced this text. But what I think, what, what I find very interesting about John Gilbert is, um, of course, we all know the story. The Book of Mormon manuscript was not punctuated. It was one giant run-on sentence, which isn't totally true. There's a few uh, scattered punctuations here and there. But but essentially, John Gilbert had to punctuate the entire Book of Mormon manuscript. And, you know, I'm, I'm not an English major. I'm a history major. But I, I know enough about the English language to know that punctuation matters uh, in, in engaging with a text. It's subtle, but it's important to know um, the phrasing or, or ending of, of a sentence or, and you know, Gilbert's introducing paragraphing. So the formatting structure, the, the way in which people pause at certain phrases is coming from a non-believer. Uh, and I, th- I think that's so interesting and, and so uh, important to remember that we, th- we think today that you can't engage in uh, Book of Mormon scholarship unless you're a believer, unless you're, uh, you know, you, you agree upon the truth claims that, that the Book of Mormon establishes. And yet, here we have John Gilbert, who's helping us read the text. He's helping us engage with the text. And to me, I, I you know, it's, it's not a perfect metaphor, but I, I find great symbolism there that um, those not believing in the Book of Mormon can help us engage with the text. They might be able to see things differently that we don't see, or they can uh, help us um, uh, just have a, give us a different perspective that we might not have. I think that information also serves as an invitation for people to take another look at, at the punctuation itself and recognize that there, there are interesting things that, that you can do. Grant Hardy uh, was at the Maxwell Institute this summer and had a, a small uh, seminar with some students about reading the Book of Mormon. And one of the activities that he had us do was to punctuate uh, hmm. a section of the Book of Mormon. And it, it, it was really cool. It was, uh, I think that's a great idea to have people do that because, like you said, punctuation matters. So we have this lesson we take away of uh, people who aren't believers, not not Mormons, not believers in the Book of Mormon, who we we should appreciate as contributors to our understanding of the text and even to the to the very shape of the text we have today. But it also lets us know that we can try our hand at that too. And it's 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 a pretty fun way of studying the Book of Mormon. Yeah, that's great. Uh, Royal Skousen tells me with his. Uh, earliest text that was published at Yale, the Book of Mormon, he stripped away all the punctuation, and then he added the punctuation. He says that was the hardest part of that. It, it was very difficult to to punctuate it because um, we're just so used to kind of this very heavily punctuated Book of Mormon, right? But um, that was very 19th century. They, they loved their punctuation, and, and we would do it differently today. And it kind of begs the question, how would that affect our reading of it today if it were completely punctuated in a different way? Um, so yeah, and I, I, I think one of the other things we need to remember, um, 
Joseph Smith uh, rightly gets a lot of the credit for the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. Uh, sometimes we hear stories of Oliver Cowdery and other scribes and whatnot, but but we need to remember that Joseph Smith relied on this whole community of, of supporters uh, during the Book of Mormon translation and publishing. Um, that the Book of Mormon, it could be argued, really is a community text. That uh, um, it, it's not until he gets the support and uh, the financial and, and, and moral support from his family and friends and other followers that, that he can sustain himself. I, I think that there's, uh, um, you know, there's this sense that Joseph Smith really struggled with this. It was a difficult task. And I, I think kind of the unsung heroes are those early supporters that, that buoyed up uh, Joseph in, in his translation and publishing. A lot of people might think of, um, of Martin Harris in that regard, right? Because he mortgages his farm, he's yeah. helping to pay for this. There, there are other people that we hear less about, and I think over time we're going to hear more and more about these people. One of them that you brought up in your uh, paper the other night uh, was Mary Whitmer. Yeah. Talk a little bit about her and the role she played. There's uh, some, a little bit of humor there, but also it really opened your eyes to that community element of creating the Book of Mormon. Yeah, no, I, um, I love this story of Mary Whitmer, um, and it kind of has a backstory with me. I was talking to uh, Dean Jesse, and he pulled me in his office once, and he says, you know, Dean Jesse, of course, had worked with uh, at the historian's office for a long time, and uh, he pulled me into his office once, and he says, I have the string that bound the original Book of Mormon manuscript, and I think I need to donate that back to the church. And I said, I think you're right. <laughs> so I, I, uh, we, we got that processed into the uh, the archives there. And, do you know how he had it? Uh, I do. It's kind of a, a strange story, uh, kind of a painful story. Uh, in the days before, um, well, conservation was not at the level that it always has been. So the original Book of Mormon manuscript like was... they used to put masking tape on Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. You should never put any sort of adhesive tape on any manuscripts if you want to see it survive. Um, but at, at a certain point, they were hoping to conserve the manuscript, and so um, they needed to... Uh, it pains me to even say it. They needed to separate the, the leaves in order to get it to the conservation place. So... Uh, Correctly, at the time of the day, they thought, well, the text is all that matters. So they sliced up the pages in half where the folds were, and they started to throw away the uh, yarn and the string that uh, bound the Book of Mormon manuscript. And Dean, so it was actually bound together? Like uh, there, a, there were portions of the original manuscript that were still bound, yeah. And it was on fool's cap paper? Uh-huh, yeah. So two pages folded in half. Uh, creating a, a, a you know essentially an eight by eleven page, and so when people in order see these individual sheets, that was not how the original yeah, was. Yeah, interesting. So and uh, so they were throwing away this this yarn and this ribbon, and Dean, with great foresight, said, you know, I probably should save some of that. So he he went dumpster diving essentially, and uh, and recovered uh, some of these and donated it back. And so as I um. As I did a little bit more of the research on that, um, I found the statement by David Whitmer when uh, he, later in his life, he had the printer's manuscript, and he pointed to uh, the string, the yarn that bound the manuscript, and said, that's my mother's yarn. Um, so for David Whitmer, this is this is not just a religious text, a religious artifact. It's a family heirloom. It's a family... It, it represented the family involvement. Uh, and so... As I looked at that, I thought, you know, this is actually a perfect um, uh, metaphor, perfect symbol of that early community. So here we have Oliver Cowdery. He's translating the Book of Mormon. He's folding up pages together and sewing them up. Transcribing it. Uh-huh. Trans yeah, so transcribing, folding them up, sewing them, binding, the binding these pages together. And he's probably not even conscious of where he's getting this yarn from. He's just he's just saying, hey, where's some yarn? I need to, to bind this. And yet... Mary Whitmer and the other Whitmer women very likely engaged in creating this yarn. Of course, this is before um, they didn't uh, just go to uh, yeah the, to the Michaels and the, the local uh, craft store. No, um, so they very Thank likely you for not buzz marketing any <laughs> craft stores. <on> <laughs> So they very likely hand spun this yarn, and for David Whitmer, this was this was a powerful symbol of his family's connection to preserving the manuscript. Um, and of course, you know that's related also to another story with Mary Whitmer, where she's hosting this this translation effort. Um, yeah, they moved the project to the Whitmer yeah, place. So from Harmony, they move up to Fayette, and you've got Joseph and Oliver and and others who are not 
pulling their weight essentially. They're they're um, doing a lot of work in the translation. And Mary Whitmer's, uh, you know, overly burdened with this these extra individuals. So yeah, you've got more mouths to feed. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the story, uh, as told by David Whitmer and and other family members, is that uh, she went out one day and and was able to see the plates and the angel came and showed her the plates as as a way of comforting her uh as a way of uh placating her to um continue on with this effort uh and so um yeah it's a great story with mary whitmer as as not only a early supporter of joseph smith sometimes reluctantly but as an early supporter but also as a early um individual who assisted in the preservation of the manuscript that's Robin Scott Jensen, along with Royal Scouse, and he co-edited the printer's manuscript of the Book of Mormon transcription by the Joseph Smith Papers Project. It's volume three of the Revelations and Translations series of that project. We'll take a brief break, and we'll be right back. For centuries, believers and scientists have wrestled over the relationship between reason and faith, science and religion. Acclaimed Latter-day Saint author and biologist Stephen L. Peck argues that reason and faith are both indispensable tools we can use to navigate God's creation. His new book is called Evolving Faith, Wanderings of a Mormon Biologist. It's a collection of essays about Mormon theology, evolution, the environment, and other scientific questions. Stephen Peck has the mind of a scientist, the soul of a believer, and the heart of a wanderer. In Evolving Faith, he provides welcome companionship for women and men engaged in an unceasing quest for further light and knowledge. You can pre-order the book today at Amazon.com. Evolving Faith is part of the Living Faith book series from the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship. To learn more about this series, go to maxwellinstitute.byu.edu slash livingfaith. We're back with Robin Jensen. He's a historian for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He recently published Volume 3 of the Revelations and Translations series in the Joseph Smith Papers Project. It's the printer's manuscript of the Book of Mormon. He worked on that project with Royal Skousen. So for the last part here, I want to talk a little bit about um, how the Doctrine and Covenants contains a revelation that commands the Church to keep records. And as a document historian, that must be uh, one of your favorites, right? It's just Absolutely. Like, like a revelation talking about the thing you love the most. So let's talk about how that kind of played out. Going back to the very beginning, how do you see that command to record playing out in the early years of the church? And how did Joseph Smith and other early church members think about uh, record keeping? So I th- I think it's interesting. I Taking a, a several steps back, looking at the general pattern of record keeping— Joseph Smith was not an uh, educated individual. He did not enjoy writing. He he could write. He could, uh, you know, he had uh, no difficulty in uh, writing a letter or a diary or whatnot. And we have um, some of those, but sure. on the Book of Mormon manuscript, very little yep, in his hand. Little right? of of his own hand. And early on, so in the you know eighteen late eighteen twenties, we have nothing from him essentially except for uh, revelations. And of course, he's dictating those to others. But when we look at the types of documents that are created, when Joseph Smith first begins his prophetic career, the first thing that are that uh, is being written down are scripture, revelations, and the Book of Mormon, and and other types of items. And it's only later where we get um, minutes or journals or histories or things like this. So as as I look at that, as I read kind of the the record keeping scene of early Mormonism. I, I see that Joseph is struggling with keeping a record, that uh, it's it does not come natural to him. And so I, th- I think that this revelation, given on the day the church was organized, behold, there shall be a record kept among you, as kind of helping Joseph along to, to realize that um, he is about to do great things and the uh, the church needs to be documented. Uh, and this is a struggle throughout his life. He's He's not always being able to document the church as well as he would like. Uh, we have several letters and other uh, minutes from him, that uh, uh, minutes of uh, addresses of him where he stresses the importance of record keeping. But then, of course, we have his uh, great desire to keep a journal. He, he purchases a journal and says, I'm going to 
keep a minute record of everything that transpires. <laughs> That's my favorite part because then like he doesn't write anything yeah, for a long he, time. Yeah, he keeps and then, the journal for a day or and two. It's and like, then, it rained today. And then it's like months <laughs> before he keeps it keeps the next uh, or writes the next entry. So he he's a he's a reluctant journalist, probably like most of us who try to keep journals, but. Uh, um, I, 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 as I look at this, I, I think that there's an important uh, process to, to consider here. The early period of the church's past is documented through reminiscences and other types of records that, that are fraught. Uh, any historian will tell you that a contemporary journal is preferable to a late reminiscence. And yet for much of the early church's uh, history, uh, before the church was organized, just as the church was organized, we have to rely upon Revelation, the Book of Mormon, and late reminiscences. That's why uh, it's hard to pin down some of the priesthood restoration uh-huh. dates and things like that. Yeah, yeah. So we, we um, I think I think it's important to remember that just because we don't have any record of something occurring does not mean that uh, we can ignore that. I, th- I think there's important uh, understanding of kind of this oral record keeping, or in other words, um, maybe a better way to say it, Joseph Smith is converting his friends and gospels uh, along a network uh, of kin and friends. Uh, And so what does he do when he wants to tell someone about uh, his first vision or the uh, angel Moroni or the coming forth of the Book of Mormon? He's not going to write it down because that's not his pattern. He's going to talk about it with others. Uh, And so we have this oral tradition, oral uh, record keeping that, by definition, of course, is not written down. Including re- some revelations you hypothesized, too. Yeah. In fact, you mentioned during your paper the other night uh, so about Emma Smith. I thought that was really interesting. Maybe uh, talk about that for Yeah, a yeah. So, for instance, we, we, know, we know for a fact that Joseph Smith received some revelations that were not written down. So, Lucy Mack Smith, uh, if if her memory can be trusted, said that the uh, commandment to, or, or it was a commandment to tell Oliver Cowdery to make a copy of the Book of Mormon. Uh, and that, and that when was they not say written, commandment, no. that, that was the word they would use for a revelation. Exactly, right? yeah. We, we, we say revelation and kind of mean it in this broad concept, but uh, early terminology, it, it was a commandment, uh, a, a divine commandment, a thus saith the Lord type of commandment. So, and you know, I've, I've hypothesized, I, um, if, if you pin me down, I'll, I'll readily admit that there's no sources for this, but uh, Emma Smith, of course, was a early supporter of Joseph and uh, assisted with the translation by being scribe to Joseph, um, and at the same time, she was also pregnant with their first child. Uh, the child does not survive the birth. Uh, there's a stillbirth, and Emma is uh, near death. She's laid up for quite a while. Um, and so I, I've often wondered, Joseph, uh, at the same time, loses this early portion of the manuscript. Martin Harris loses it. And we have revelations talking about the lost Book of Mormon manuscript. We have revelations to Oliver Cowdery explaining what he his role in the translation is. We have revelations to Martin Harris talking about the publication and printing of the Book of Mormon. Where are the revelations to Emma Smith, giving her comfort for the loss of their child? Where's Where are the revelations to uh, Mary Whitmer and others who are supporting Joseph, um, but not, you know, not engaged in kind of an institutional support or institutional right. process? It was within, separate from the institutional uh-huh. matters. And, and I, I think it, it's it's fun to hypothesize. We don't know for sure, but I, I, I think that Joseph must have received some sort of revelation for these individuals that were not written down. You, you think of some of the revelations. So section four, for instance, the revelation to Joseph Smith's father. It, it's, it's, it's this wonderful revelation, but I wonder, I think, my hunch is, is that there's actually quite a few more of those that just were never written down. It makes sense. I, th- I think it's a really interesting idea. And obviously there is, there's one section of the Doctrine and Covenants that is addressed to Emma, and it's in the context of, mostly in the context of something she's going to be doing for the Church. Yeah, uh, she's supposed to be a hymnal. She's compiling a hymnal and teaching the saints. Right. Yeah. So so it, see, it, it seems possible that there was kind of that distinction being made. I, I think it's really interesting. One argument you could make to counter that might be, you know, does the does does the phrasing of that revelation seem to imply 
that it's an initial revelation that maybe she hadn't had one before. I don't know. I'd have to go back and read, but could be, yeah. But yeah, yeah. you'd have to see like is is the Lord really introducing himself to Emma as though for the first time directly, or you know that sort of thing. So, and, and this is where I think we as scholars of Mormon Mormonism have um, there, there's a lot more that we can do. We um, because early scholars of the early Christianity have scrutinized their manuscripts so closely. Um, we've just taken for granted and, and have not done the same type of, of analysis. And I, and I think there's so much that we could be doing in uh, looking at these early manuscripts uh, that's not explicitly mentioned in the manuscripts, but understanding the, the patterns of record keeping, the types of, of documents they're writing down, all of this can uh, can open up new vistas of, of Mormon scholarship. Yeah, I think when you say drop the ball, I, I agree with you that that phrase doesn't quite work because it's more like they're just now getting the ball yeah. in the form of these, like the Joseph Smith Papers Project, making yep. this stuff available to people to be able to even begin to formulate those types of questions that previously wouldn't be formulated because we just had this printed book of finished revelations. Yep, so. absolutely, absolutely. And, and that's, you know, if if... In the next 50 years, this scholarship just explodes, and they're relying upon the Joseph Smith Papers Project, then we will be a, a great success. I mean, that that is what we are doing. That's why we're publishing these uh, manuscripts and the transcriptions, so that scholars can have easier access for these documents, so that they can begin to ask these kinds of questions. And not only the scholars, but regular members of the Church can make use of these, and that's that that gets interesting, because then they'll see the grammatical errors and typo, or, you know, uh, misspellings, and they'll see revelations being edited and changed, and for some people that, that seems really unusual, uh, yeah. the fact that that hasn't been emphasized much until recently. Uh, I think people in the far past kind of just understood that was the process of preparing a, a revelation for publication. I think the people that were actually involved in editing sections of the Doctrine and Covenants way back then just understood that was part of the process, but today that comes as a surprise, and some people could say, well, what kind of a revelation is it? If it would require that type of editing, what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, so you know, we uh, we open up our scriptures in Sunday school or whatnot. We see the printed word, uh, and we we make a few assumptions that I think are wrong. Um, I love I love the terminology Grant Underwood uses about the revelations that uh, Joseph is not a fax machine for for God. Um, Joseph is uh, engaging with these texts the best he can. Um, and I you know I've I've looked at the Book of Mormon manuscript uh, and I've realized there. are Errors introduced all along the way. Human errors uh, just happen. Whenever you copy something, whenever you print something, there's going to be uh, unintended uh, errors that slip in. Um, and, you know, members need to think about the implications. Does Is God going to micromanage uh, the text of the Book of Mormon? Uh, some would argue that it's certainly within the realm of possibility, which would make sense. But, but I think that... Uh, um, a book of scripture might uh, serve us better if we can have a bit more of a complex, nuanced approach to it. The coming forth of the Book of Mormon um, did not come from golden plates to our printed text as we see it today. There's a whole process there that, you know, if if we're if we're thinking devotionally or if we were to put on, uh, you know, a church member hat, maybe we could say um, that that might uh, we could compare that to uh, our own lives, where we, we have an idea, we have a, a kind of a concept, a general conference a co- concept of building up Zion. Is God going to micromanage every single step along the way? No. Uh, we're going to stumble and, and make a few mistakes along along the path, which, uh, according to Mormon theology, is, is what we're here on earth for. The last question I had uh, before we go is actually kind of more of a logistical one, and that's you have a 14-page introduction to this, uh, to the Printer's Manuscript edition. 14 pages to cover all of this information. Logistically, how did you, did you write that with Royal? Or how? Yeah, so uh, I wrote it and then he reviewed it. Uh, so how, how, did you, how did you winnow down from all of the documents and all of the things that you could have talked about? To get it down to 14 pages seems like a it's sometimes harder to make something short than yeah. it is to make it long. Yeah. So um, the Joseph Smith papers, we our, our philosophy is that we should assist scholars uh, as best as we can, but we should not necessarily lead them down a particular uh, scholarly theory too far. If we don't know things, we shouldn't 
Um, we shouldn't speculate too much. We should just present the evidence as we know it. Um, and so brevity is often uh, what we prefer in, in the, some of the introductions. We set the stage. We uh, alert readers to the information that they absolutely need. And then, as I said earlier, uh, if the scholars can take that and run with it and, and form their own opinions, then that's where that's where we have succeeded. The um, introduction to this volume is a bit is a bit different, uh, and it's purposefully uh, brief uh, and uh, general. So some have asked why we started with the printer's manuscript and not the original. Yeah. Um, and I th I think the the main reason is that the printer's manuscript presents the complete text of the Book of Mormon. We want we wanted the first time that we presented this text to be the complete text, except for the line and a half that's yes. missing. But uh, by the but, way, did you fill that in at all, or did you? Just uh, we did. We out? in in uh, not in brackets, but in in our editorial style, we've we've shown uh, what the words were based on the 1830 uh, Book of Mormon, so cool. it's still there. Um, but some have asked why the printer's manuscript, and uh, we think that the scholars' first engagement with the text it should be the complete text. Yeah. Also, within the annotation, we have tracked uh, with the significant versions of other uh, editions, so the original manuscript, the 1830, the 1837, other editions during Joseph Smith's lifetime. So it really presents uh, a good picture of not just the text of the Book of Mormon, but other versions of the Book of Mormon. And so uh, as part of that, we decided with the introduction that it should be kind of a general overview of the coming forth the Book of Mormon, or or the uh, finding of the plates up through the public, the printing, the publication uh, of of that uh, work, and we could have we could have done a fifty or eighty page yeah. introduction, I suppose, but uh, that would have been a lot of work, and uh, <laughs> and and I and I th I think that uh, once again that there's. Joseph's story of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, there's other uh, individuals who wants to uh, explain that in a different way. And, and I think that uh, we're not going to be able to solve that in the introduction to, for this. That there's, there's great scholarly debate uh, uh, of what, what Joseph is actually doing and, and uh, uh, pious fraud or is deluded or, or whatnot. Um, that, that's, that's historiography. That's kind of an engagement of historiography that we tend not to do with the Joseph Papers. We, we envision these volumes being on the shelf for the next 50, 80, 100 years. And um, if we engaged in the historiographical debates of the you know, of 2015, yeah. then it's going to age it quite quickly. Uh, yeah, you just want to give, so it's like you just want to give the, the tools. You want to just put the data out there yep. and then let the theories and obviously, data is theory theory laden still, yeah, right? Yeah, but no, but I think you're right that you're safer. You're going to get more longevity uh, the less theory you uh, you try to put into it. But you see projects growing out of it, even from Joseph Smith Papers people, right? So yep. we have uh, Garrett Dirk Matt and Michael McKay who put a book out about the Book of Mormon translation. And a lot of that drew on work they did the Joseph Smith Papers project. Do you have similar work that you're doing where you're uh, carrying on uh, in that way? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I've um the first thing I need to do is invent a machine that will stop time so that I can uh, get all, all the projects I, I need to... I believe uh, Hermione <laughs> has this oh, uh, yeah. uh, thing that, yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, I, I'm, I'm actually very interested in uh, Revelation record keeping. Uh, I've, I've done quite a few papers and whatnot. I'd, I'd like to put that together in a book of some sort, but um, dissertation comes first. I've got to finish that. And uh, What's um, your subject there? So the dissertation, surprise, surprise, is on uh, Mormon record keeping. Uh, <laughs> it's the uh, history of the church historian's office, uh, cool. most of the most of the nineteenth century. So, uh, I th I think we've uh, we have scholars have uh, utilized the church archives to great effect, but we've ignored what the church archives actually was. Uh, and there's there's a lot of interesting uh, uh, nuances and an interesting, um, yeah, they've they've been an important part of uh, the Mormon conception of, of self-identity uh, yeah. that I'm going to explore. So Good. So we can look forward to seeing some more of that stuff come out. Yeah. That's Robin Scott Jensen. He's a historian for The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and co-editor of the Printer's Manuscript of the Book of Mormon, which is Volume 3 of the Revelations and Translations series of the Joseph Smith Papers Project. Thanks for coming in today, Robin. It's my pleasure. It's good to talk to you.